morning, good evening, good afternoon, whatever it is, wherever you are. Um, on tap for today, we have our usual reminders about the upcoming Hackfest in June in Amsterdam um, and the internship progress, uh, project ugh, program, sorry, it's early, um, which uh, the deadline for students to apply is um, what's today, 22nd, tomorrow. So um, if you're interested in that, please, uh, or you know somebody who is, please make sure they get that in there. Um, <clears throat> Today we're going to have uh, an update from Explorer and uh, and then from a working group perspective we have requirements this week, correct? Yes. And we have um, somebody on for, is, is Clive or Oleg on for requirements? Uh, Clive is on. Okay, awesome, awesome. Um, and uh, then I have updated the um, uh, the lifecycle document to add, you know, this uh, sort of first major release stage um, requiring a uh, TSC uh, review and approval. And so we can go over that. And then um, we have a proposal for a template to standardize on launching working groups. And um, we have a thread on that. So, uh, and, and then finally, um, I think, uh, Dave is going to regale us with a proposal to open up the bug bounty for hyperlinked fabric to the public. Any other agenda items for today? We've got a pretty busy agenda. Okay, then I think we'll turn it over to who's giving the update on Explorer. That would be me, Vinita. I'm representing Parda. Parda is unfortunately uh, occupied uh, in another meeting. Okay, right now. great, super. Okay, so um, I joined the Hyperledger Explorer project last month. So there's a, quite a few new members that have joined uh, in the last quarter. Uh, we have um, Ashish Kumar, Jitendra Dikit from uh, American Express India. Um, Nick Franza, Mikia Edwards, and myself, we are from DTCC, and we have recently added Cam Mac of Inspire Technologies uh, from California. Uh, we are making good progress. Uh, at this time, the project status is green. There are two major changes we have made in this quarter in the past uh, six weeks or so is the front end uh, was switched to React.js, so we have a new UI design. Um, American Express folks are helping us with the with the with the UI design work, As, and um, besides that, we have also switched out our database from MySQL to Postgres. Um, there are changes going on on that, and also uh, with a DB redesign for future development in mind. So our current plans uh, are to finish up whatever we have started. So we have quite a few things on the front end going on. We want to complete the hookup of the front end with the back end data and finish that in the upcoming quarter. We also also want to add some admin functionality so work helping us with that is cam for with starting with adding a channel that's uh, the first admin functionality we will be adding to uh, Explorer so that is the update and I did post the update uh, to the wiki so it should be up there if anybody is interested in looking at what it what the Hyperledger Explorer looks like right now. I can share my screen if that is okay, and uh, sure. show that. Okay, okay. One second. Okay, here we go. Share screen. Okay, so I have it running locally right now on my machine. So 
so can, can you guys see my screen? Yes. I can, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, yeah. perfect. So, so this is the new look and feel we were talking about. So we, we do need to add a logo up top here, which is something we will be doing over the next couple of days. We do have a logo in place right now, but we just hadn't had a chance to put it in. Uh, uh, I have the uh, file that was created for us this morning, so we will be adding that soon. So right now it has uh, five major navigation um, uh, possibilities up top. So when you first log in, dashboard is where you would be presented to. This is where we want to show some analytics about how many blocks uh, coming per hour, per minute, or transactions per hour. So this is something we are working on right now. So we, we know what we want to put here. You only see what the one transaction that got pushed uh, last night that when I was working with this, uh, the, the one block right now. And um, the activity chart right now down here that would be showing blocks as they come in. This is right now static data, but we are working on um, making it dynamic. So you will see it as it comes in. Um, peer graph, so right now the network we have up and running has four peers. So this is just showing that. Then we have the network tab, which is going to list all the peers in the network currently. The blocks will list all the blocks that we have right now. So this is the data that is coming from our Postgres database right now. And uh, this is transactions page right now is static, but we are working on uh, making it dynamic. So it pulls the data from the database and puts it up. And also the smart contracts uh, is to be uh, done. It is in the works. So this is all going to be driven off of what channel you're looking at. We are building functionality to be able to change the channel. So right now, there's, this is the only channel we have, the My Channel. And this is where we are at with this. And that is my update. Any questions? <clears throat> Thanks, Anita. Um, any okay. questions? How does it interact with identity? Meaning, uh, is, is, right. are people uh, able to see, um, uh, you know, is there any restriction on who can see what? We haven't gotten that far yet. We have to build that into it. So this is, this is the very first basic uh, being able to take a peek into the ledger and see what's on there. But yes, that will be uh, coming up in, in future sprints for us. So will it support the, the Fabric 1.0 and the 1.1 version together? Oh, this is working with the Fabric 1.0 right now. I see 1.1 is released, but we haven't up, uh, upgraded to that yet. So that is also going to be happening sometime soon. OK. Um, second question is about the, the, the Docker image. Do, do uh, have any plan that uh, make uh, some Docker image? Yes, for so service? absolutely, absolutely. So that, that, is, uh, that is what we were discussing yesterday. So make it easier to provide a Docker image for people to get up and running quick. That is also slated for, for the second quarter. Okay, cool, thanks. And can you speak about your plans for um, supporting the other Hyperledger uh, infrastructure projects? I am afraid I don't have an insight into that. Maybe uh, Parda might be able to give a better update on that. Um, I can get back to you on that. I know when I was in China, uh, one chain who was working on the Explorer project talked about uh, supporting Sawtooth as uh, one of the next things that they wanted to do. Um, I don't know what the status of that is, but I, I know that they uh, they had it in their plans. Um, oh, they so did. Okay. They did. Yep. Okay. So unfortunately, they're not 
on the project anymore. Uh, I'm not sure what happened, but they, they are not uh, at this point um, on the on the contributors list. Uh, cool. I my, I myself joined last month, so I'm not sure what the status is there. Okay. Okay, I, I don't know if uh, Iroha already has a explorer capability. I know that they had started off with a lot of uh, handset capabilities with their platform, so you might be able to find existing code within uh, their project that would help you. Oh, awesome. Similar okay. capabilities there, yeah. And then mm -hmm. uh, on the Sawtooth project, we had a contribution a few months back adding in a, an explorer that was geared towards Sawtooth and you'd be more than welcome to just grab that code as a starting point. So you'll see that in Sawtooth Explorer, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is I think what the repo is called underneath Hyperledger. And then uh, I think Nate is on from the Indie project if there's uh, some similar Explorer capabilities there. Um, on the Indie side, we haven't added an Explorer capability yet. We do have some APIs to get the right transaction sets and the right information out of the system. Um, so, you know, if there is a common code base for kind of the UI side, I think that there's some interest in integrating the, those APIs into whatever um, uh, others are using. Right, yeah. that, would, that would make sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would guess across all of the projects, and I think this is an assumption that led to the, the creation of, of your project, the assumption that for most of these blockchains, there's just going to be a couple simple uh, RESTful GET queries. Correct. that would get right. most of the information from these chains. So it shouldn't be a, a wide set of differing APIs that you'd have to address. Well, actually, there probably is. But right. I right now we have uh, the, yeah. So right now we have the Node SDK we are using for, for, for Fabric. So. Right. I mean, I think that this is, you know, this is an opportunity to, you know, be collaborating across all the projects to get alignment on what that might be. Um, if we want that to be uh, indeed, you know, sort of cross platform, there are going to be some distinctions, right? You know, we was talking about, you know, sort of per channel um, visibility. Um, obviously, I'm, I'm, I'm unaware of any other of the um, platform projects that we have that has the concept of channels. But, you know, so, so there are going to be some impedance mismatches that we have to sort of work through. But I think, you know, maybe this is an opportunity, maybe in the context of um, the architecture working group and then in conjunction with all the projects that are interested in getting integration with the Explorer function so that we have a common Explorer across all of these it really involve it, it. What it really means is that it's a, um, it's a collaborative effort, right? So. Um, you know, I, I heard asks for, you know, when is Blockchain Explorer going to do the Sawtooth integration? Um, I heard similarly, you know, the discussion about um, Composer. And, and really what it boils down to is it boils down to everybody, um, uh, you know, what, what, what is the interest? You know, open source is developed by people scratching an itch. If you have an interest in doing something, you get down and you do it. Um, um, so I think, you know, what we need to do is we need to be thinking about how are we going to affect a little bit more collaboration to actually get these things done if that's what we want to do. Yeah, and I guess I was trying to point out that there's probably not 30 different API calls at, at each project. It's probably a small handful, so it's a tractable problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that was that was part of the impetus for this, this project. Right. And then when project sponsors come forward to create a project that has the aspiration of being uh, across the, the Hyperledger technologies. That's, that's certainly a, a statement that, that they're looking to go do that, that work as far as it being a kind of a duocracy. So there's going to, there will have to be a balance between if if a cross project uh, effort is started, how much does that imply a resource demand on the existing projects and how much is that a, uh, a statement by those people starting the new project that they're the ones that are taking up the, the onus to go across those projects? 
and I think w one of the things that you know the fact that there are explorers that there is an explorer for um, Sawtooth is an indication of a desire um, for that for that capability. So in the you know in the duocracy um, uh, view of things, a and the other observation is that the longer we go down the path with an assumption of a single backend, um, the more bound we are and the harder it is to add additional features. So, um, it, you know, that again, as, as Dan says, if there's some intention for something being kind of um, cross hyperledger capabilities, then there has to be some pressure put on, on ensuring that that happens. Well, but again, Mick, I'm not sure the pressure is the right adjective here. I mean, I think yeah, you're right. Of, I, it's more a function of if I agree, look, but you but know, you you understand what I'm saying though that there has to be some I, I do motivation I, to do I, it. But again, I think that you know it was also a function, and if I recall correctly, the way that it was presented was, you know, other backends could be supported. It wasn't oh, we intend to do all you know support for all the backends, and actually I think there was just the two at the time, right? And and then there was an explorer backend, you know, this the Sawtooth Explorer backend was was contributed, but there wasn't. And we did discuss some collaboration between the two projects, but I don't recall any of that ever happening. So, um, uh, you know, I, again, I think, as I was trying to say before, I think it's on us collectively to find ways that we can do this collaboration so that we can end up with not multiples, um, uh, but, you know, we can have a common project that is in fact across you know, and, and satisfies those requirements, but it means that there's a certain alignment of APIs or a certain degree of alignment of the APIs to get access to the information we're looking for. And then um, uh, agreement that, you know, we'll, sh we'll share some resource in, 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 in doing that work, um, uh, you know, necessary to do the, the, the integration with the various backends. Um, and, you know, I think, as I said, you know, the architecture work group is an opportunity, you know, we could leverage that potentially to try and figure out what you know what it would be, and then share that with, amongst the various projects, so that we can actually start working towards that objective. Um, and you know, if there's a Sawtooth Explorer, then I think collaboratively working to figure out, understand that code base, and figure out how it does integrate. You know, maybe what we need is to have uh, a pluggable set of widgets, gadgets, whatever you want to call them. Um, that are, uh, you know, reflective of an underlying uh, platform, uh, but that are particular to a platform, because maybe there are some distinctions like channels and so forth that you need to be able to hype, you know, to um, uh, elevate to the level of an explorer. But all, all I'm really saying is that I think that level of collaboration is needed in order to pull this off. <laughs> the other, I well, mean, I, I do think that if a project has taken on a charter, though, they are taking on the responsibility for fulfilling that charter. And in the case of Explorer, my recollection is that the charter for that was to be a cross-platform Explorer. Otherwise, it wouldn't have been, you know, interesting outside the realm of, of uh, say, Fabric specifically in this case. But likewise, you know, it would be weird to take an Iroha Explorer and put that out as a Hyperledger Explorer with yeah, the stated think, goal of being cross-project. I, I think Dan's pointing out the other end of the spectrum, Chris, which is just an acknowledgement that this is really a fabric project. Um, change the charter to reflect that and make it essentially managed as a sub-project under fabric. I think that at the very least, we should have integration milestones. You know, we should set a few... Uh, I don't know if it's quarterly or every uh, even two months. We try to put some API that people can plug into and get some feedback maybe across the project. If 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 all these people want to chime in, right? I don't know. Just to make it easy for other people to understand, like how much they need to do in order to work together. At the moment, we just update each other about what we have done. Right? Maybe we should tell about kind of what we are doing, so that it's easy to kind of. Let's say if now it's March, maybe, okay, mid-May, we'll have something to look up to. And then if a sub-project or another project needs to change some stuff to work together, like the pluggable things that Chris mentioned, it's going to be easy. At the moment, I think 
that the projects don't talk to each other at all, right? At least in the context of Explorer. So so to say something, you write the plan, um, you know, it doesn't look like we even have the milestones on, on any roadmap. Right, and that's, yeah. that's, that's really my point. I think, you know, again, if, you, you know, if, if, if we wanna do this, and, and I think we should, and I think many of us do want to get to this level of collaboration, we have to stop acting as if we're all independent competing projects and start working collaboratively across the various projects. Now it's starting to happen. But again, I think that it, it does require sort of investment and interest and execution by all of us collectively. That's all I'm saying. These Well, if, if the Explorer team can, can publish some APIs that people can plug, plug stuff into, it's going to be easier so that we don't have to dive in too much into it, right? Well, would I, that I think it's the other way around though, right? That the other projects should say what they expect? That, yes, yeah, something that's an Explorer that's reading information, so that's calling the APIs that are produced by the, by the other projects, so. Right to that point, uh, the roadmap that was presented to us, uh, we this is not uh, even though we started with the fabric, uh, this is not just for fabric. There is uh, on, on our roadmap uh, items to make it compatible with uh, Ethereum, Sawtooth, and other platforms too. So this this is just the starting point. We started with fabric. Well, Ethereum is a different beast. Ethereum has a different API, right? Like completely different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ethereum is, is, yeah. Well, they all do. That's yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so does, so does they all are right? different. So you're going to have to have an API that's pretty f open, flexible to accommodate, you know, significant variations. And I think the yes. I I think it would be an interesting challenge to actually do that, and you know. You have to kind of, I mean, there are two possibilities, right? It's always like this. Either you take the common denominator and it's not going to be very useful, or you have to make it, you know, capable of handling as much as you can and, you know, have some part be not appearing or be disabled if it's not provided by the underlying framework. I do think, you know, it's still, it, it should still be a goal, but I agree, you know, we cannot force people to work on things if they don't want to. This is open source, right? No, but then the charter should change, right? That, that's what Dan is saying. If people don't yeah. want to work on it, yeah. I, I, I think that's the, only, that's the only point that I was having as well, is, is that, look, let the charter reflect the reality of the project. Yeah. Well, I'm just saying that it's a sad reality. <laughs> yeah. yeah no no true true very true it's a sad reality that's not going to change until we view hyperledger more than we view our individual interests that's exactly right Mick. right and and <clears throat> we're not there yet so yeah yeah i, I, I don't even know if i if i'd go quite in that direction with it I, for me it's it's quite simply the the charter that a project aspires to if they're marching down a path that's making progress towards that charter that's great and so if if the charter is wide then that's that's what they've signed up for so yeah but so let's give her uh, let's give them a chance we heard from vinita that they still have this pro this plan right so i think we can at this point, it's fair for the TSE to express the, you know, uh, to, to basically give a reminder that the goal of the project and the charter is to support more than one framework. And, right. and, and uh, completely and, agree. Not hmm, suggesting right. any, uh, any remediations right now, just that recognition. Okay. Well, actually, but I am. I'm suggesting if that's really interesting to the Sawtooth community, for instance, then some of the Sawtooth engineers are going to have to or, or people that are interested in Sawtooth are going to have to step up uh, to help accelerate that if that's indeed what is needed. Everybody is driven by whatever their priorities are, right? And 
you know, I think well, at most point, we can't but, just expect that people are going to do things because, you know. No, I, no, I, yeah, I, I, I totally disagree, Chris. I'm yeah. saying that the <clears throat> charter that they signed up for was to go cross-project. If that's what you said you want to do, that's what you were going to do. I'm not saying that, uh, I don't think that we can reverse the tables and say that a project can come out and claim that they will be uh, a cross-project effort and then require resources from all the other programs. Yeah, so to, I mean, to reinforce that point, um, Sawtooth has an explorer that's clearly a priority for the community, for the Sawtooth community, but it's easier for Sawtooth to build their own explorer than it is to go off and try to modify and work with something that's principally focused on uh, fabric. You see you're, 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 you're getting in, and, and again, that ease is sort of avoiding the collaboration. And that's my point. And I, I don't think it's avoiding collaboration okay. at all. I mean, we've put out the APIs, the code is out there. Somebody has signed up to say, all right, there's an interesting problem here, which is how can you come up with an interface that goes across multiple APIs? That's work that the, the Explorer project signed up for. Dan, I, I understand, but I don't recall any effort whatsoever to reach out and engage the Explorer team before that work was done. That's all, that's my In point. the very early stages, one of the first uh, hack fests we had, we worked on what was a common API. I have no idea what happened with the artifacts of that, but there was some initial effort at that. And certainly all of our API documentation is, I mean, it's pretty straightforward. I just put the links in there. It's not like there's a lack of collaboration in the sense that there's withholding of information or anything I didn't like say any information was being withheld. Again, it's a mat again, open source is a duocracy. It means if you're interested in doing something, if you have an itch, you scratch it. And, you know, I think, you know, if, if, if we all operate on the premise that, you know, somebody else is going to do something, then nothing will ever get done. That's my only point. And, and so, again, if the interest is in the collaboration, engage and, and remain engaged and remain and, and, and continue to press that. But if we're not interested in doing that, then maybe you're right. Maybe we should just acknowledge the fact that these are all independent projects. But I think to make point, we do, we, we, I, I think that we should be, or, you know, aligning a little bit more towards the, the ideal that, you know, that Brian and others are um, uh, affecting with this organization, and that is to have it be an umbrella there that that fosters the kind of collaboration, innovation, cross project to the, to the point where we do have pluggable components that interoperate with one another. That's that's where we're. I think I think that's where we're trying to get. Maybe we should stop fooling ourselves, but I I personally think that that's where we should be heading. <coughs> Hey, I got, this is Brian. I've been trying to talk for about 15 minutes, but but fighting the the new feature. <laughs> um, uh, sorry about that. But I, you know, there there are certainly some mandates that I think the TFP can place on projects, and that you know overall we can expect projects to do, even if they didn't want to. One of those is you know a release process. What do you get to call a 1.0, right? Some one of those might be you know, paying attention and joining other uh, working groups around architecture, those sorts of things. I mean, the things that have to do with the quality of the release, things that have to do with following kind of a standardized development process. One of the things I don't think we really can mandate of a project is to do work that none of the individual developers, to add specific features, to add specific functions, that the developers on that project simply aren't otherwise motivated to do, because the response to that won't be you know, we get those features built despite developers not wanting to work on it, the response will be they leave the project. Um, the only way to really affect this is to, for somewhere, a developer to show up with patches, just as if they showed up on Sawtooth and said, here are patches to implement support for Poet on uh, chips other than Intel, right? Uh, there's no expectation on Intel to support other non-Intel chips with, with Poet extensions, right? Um, I, likewise, we need, we need those developers to show up. And the only way that we as, as uh, the project have to do that, to pay for work like that to be done is the internships. Um, uh, we can talk about whether we want to pay for other types of development that don't spontaneously appear of their own accord. I think that's a, that's a very, very dangerous path, but, but one that could be on the table. 
But other than those, you know, paying for that kind of work, um, I don't really feel like we can cause that support to materialize short of one of the now many companies using and depending upon SATU to um, be interested in doing that work. Um, as long as the project, as long as uh, Explorer, uh, as long as those developers are not actively refusing to support that kind of thing, I don't think we should change the charter. I think the only reason you would change the charter of Explorer is if you wanted to prevent <laughs> somebody from adding support for SATU to it, uh, or prevent somebody from adding a real support. Otherwise, leave that pos prospect, that possibility open. Yeah, I guess, Brian, what differentiates a sub-project then from a cross-project, right? Because, you know, if if we were to create something that was, you know, let's say propose a Hyperledger wallet, and, it, and we're only staffed and resourced to do that for Eroha, why should that not just be a Eroha wallet instead of a Hyperledger wallet? I, because by definition, if you showed up to an Aroha wallet and said, hey, I've got support for Sawtooth for this, and they, and they felt charge the charter would allow them to say no to that, right? If instead it's the, no, this is a Hyperledger wallet, so if somebody shows up with patches to support Aroha, or patches to support Sawtooth or Fabric, the developer should at least meet them halfway by saying, here's where you can go, or here's the API to follow, or hey, that's, that's, that's great, but it needs to support this feature. You know, like internally you can have that mm -hmm. cohesion, that, that here's, here's the standard to me, but unless the charter were to say, this is the Aroha wallet, there's no reason the developers should say, that's not, that's not something we will support, point blank, no matter how good the quality of the patches are. Well, I think everybody's uh, set a piece here, and maybe we can chew on that over the intervening week and uh, uh, head on to the next subject. I agree. Okay, so Claude, thank you, Vanita. Um, and uh, next up is the requirements working group update. So Clive. Hi, everybody, it's Clive Bolton here. I've been heading the uh, requirements working group up now for a year or more. And so I've got some um, uh, mixed uh, reports. Um, <clears throat> the report actually spans more than the past quarter. It's more, I'd say, the past year. Um, so folks, when they come along to the requirements working group, we don't have a, um, a regular cadre <clears throat> of attendees. Uh, the folks who come along to the uh, requirements working group, um, we have a couple, but Generally, the folks who come to the attend the requirements working group are um, on new solution architects who've joined consultancies who show up a couple of times. Uh, sometimes <clears throat> um, folks uh, from the uh, consultancies intend to author requirements, but very rarely do they actually get to author requirements. Um, after talking with some of them, quite often the reason for that is that um, once they, and actually this has happened a couple of times, once they start uh, <clears throat> sharing, uh, authoring requirements, it, it leads them into the business ideas and that gets cut off pretty quickly. Um, in fact, very abruptly, uh, it's, it stops because I think they're sharing <clears throat> some IP and ideas and we've already uh, covered many of the use cases which span uh, generic, um, functionality. Um, this actually happened um, <clears throat> last week. Uh, the product traceability uh, group came along from, I think, uh, North America and uh, produce traceability group came along and <clears throat> they got a, a marvelously rich website but don't really have any starting place and uh, to, to go to to implement Hyperledger. And I'll, I'll come to that in a little bit because most of the folks that I'm talking to are not really developers. They're uh, solution, uh, solution architects or even business architects. Um, what is happening though, <clears throat> increasingly, and I've actually visited some of these folks uh, personally, actually even flown to a couple of, and actually gone out of country to visit somebody in Canada, um, is we have uh, folks coming to Hyperledger who really want to um, develop new SaaS and, and solutions, but they don't, they, they have a different starting point than a, um, 
than a technical starting point. They, they start at requirements, but they, they need that next step uh, to, to get going. And they, they find that the, um, the, many of them I find are now looking for a, uh, a mobile uh, client, a mobile application that interacts with the Hyperledger projects and are almost looking for a, um, uh, a copy and paste um, mobile app. So I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, I'm going to skip over our accomplishments over the past quarter because these have been a reflection of what I've just um, updated, just gave. And also, they are um, <clears throat> they're actually, I would say, more of a um, contributions over the past year, over the past four quarters. Um, and they span everything from input from a research group on after the fact mandate changes that got stopped pretty abruptly to um, su uh, supply chain counter anti counterfeiting. And we recently had a, um, an academic project uh, submitted, uh, contributed by uh, Tata Consultancy on uh, and actually a full, full um, belt to braces. Uh, permission blockchain on fabric. So, um, and there's links to that on the, on the, on the, on the update. Um, so the way in terms of like our participant diversity, we have, um, we have folks coming from all over the, uh, and, and the U S and also Canada and, and, and in internationally. And again, I think the, uh, certainly the folks coming from India, are much more interested in a in a mobile uh, um, uh, helping foster a mobile uh, requirements for a mobile client, and and also in uh, Canada as well with the um, Canadian government uh, legalizing the um, small growers of uh, of cannabis, and so there's a need for a mobile client to. Um, and actually, this interfaces with the product traceability um, uh, dot org uh, to 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 provide a, a very simple in, uh, app which interfaces with a larger um, uh, SaaS hyperledger um, uh, database. And um, so, I think that the overall at the requirements uh, work group our our um, our folks, our participants, folks showing up, have changed from um, sort of folks who come along to because they've recently joined the Hyperledger um, blockchain um, ecosystem, just navigating, trying to understand how do they plug in, probably into these other projects that we've just spoken about, like, um, like uh, such as Explorer, um, but they're and they're also particularly interested that when they make any contributions to the requirements working group that, that they rarely do, um, how do we interface with the other groups, such as the architecture working group? Um, and I don't think we um, have done a great job of that um, so far. And I think the opportunity is to um, I personally, um, I, I am a, a developer or a program manager developer. I, and uh, I have actually been given some, actually reprising Mark Miller's work um, on, uh, on security, particularly uh, capabilities in uh, JavaScript and also mobile applications. And I think this is probably a, um, a message in a bottle um, that, um, that we could be working to um, with some of the business people to m on the requirements of, of a mobile app and then turn that into some UI screens, just getting some um, and trying to do the simplest things possible to make a uh, easy to get going mobile app that works with some of the um, more popular hyperledger projects, whatever the easiest way to do that is whether it's the RESTful API that was commented on earlier. So that's, um, that's pretty much my update. I would actually like to add additionally, I think it's really important, and somebody put this in the chat, that the, um, the one, 
the, the, the sample, sample code that we um, come up with should really, should be uh, in, in, in light of Meltdown and Spectra and Cambridge Analytica and all that stuff, and the ability of new standards which have dropped in uh, ECMAScript 2015, ES6 and so forth, we should be um, coming up with um, the best security um, templates or just that we can in, in sample code. And, and I think there's a number of ways to go about doing that. So that's, that's pretty much my um, update and I'd love to hear any feedback. Thanks for the, uh, the thorough description there. Uh, I'd taken a look at some of the, the meeting minutes and, and been listening to your feedback on, on what sounds like the principal challenges that the, if I can overstate things slightly, that the, the requirements work group has difficulty producing requirements. And I wonder if we're at a stage now after this working group has been active for so long that we can thank the working group participants for their time and maybe transition that community into a discussion forum so they can keep uh, forward momentum with uh, the sorts of uh, mobile app discussions that you were talking about there. Uh, but we can archive the products such as they are so far from this working group and then there won't be any confusion by any of the, the general public that comes to the Hyperledger working group, uh, comes to the Hyperledger requirements site and, and gets maybe uh, some confusion based on the, the current state of artifacts there. I think I would, I would support that and I would support that for two, two really important uh, fact-driven reasons. One is that we do occasionally get folks who come along and add a, um, a document title to the Hyperledger uh, requirements um, that we're working on, but that's all they do. They don't actually add, actually add a document and they, I think they add it because they would like to get to those requirements or they would like to have somebody else correct their requirements, but it never actually happens unless one of us who's, I would say, is a, a more regular participant and there's not too many, um, dig in and actually use our expertise to author those requirements. Um, so that has happened, but it's, it's attenuated to, to, to pretty much zero. So I, but on the other hand, this, this, this discussion and this um, need to um, get going with Hyperledger projects from an app, an app developer point of view has, uh, I'm not sure about it surged the right ways, but it, it's, it's active and it's, it's, it's tangible. Um, I get, and the other thing that happens is I, I get, you know, private invites, please, you know, could we talk about this privately because they've got some sort of a business idea and they don't want to quite share that, but they need this application piece. And I would like to um, help surface that and turn that into, into code or into some working, uh, especially app code. Great. Right. So, and, and, you know, this is, I've been saying this for the longest time and every time, you know, people ask me, how come there aren't more, you know, use cases and requirements and, you know, the fundamentally in Clive, you just, you just mentioned this, people aren't willing to share for various, you know, oh my God, we're going to disrupt the world, um, you know, sort of business thoughts. And so they're somewhat unwilling to share what their use cases are because they don't want to give away their bright ideas to somebody else. But, um, you know, I, I, I know, you know, I know that, you know, the, 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 the folk that are working on, you know, the various platforms, the various tools are being driven by some set of requirements. Some of those are getting shared, you know, within the context of the projects, um, uh, you know, as, you know, JIRAs or, you know, whatever, uh, have issues or what have you, um, uh, you know, that are motivating development of some new feature or of some capability um, and and we're we're you know maybe the approach that we've been thinking about is somewhat uh you know turned on its head that instead of that that we actually work to see 
how are the requirements that are driving the development of sawtooth and fabric and burrow and indy and aroha aligned or not as the case may be and surfacing where they're common and surfacing where they're different and then trying to understand both aspects of that right why are these the same and why are these different is there different use cases is you know what's mm -hmm. motivating the, that that set of things mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know i think in, initially you know we had the idea of starting with a set of use cases and then distilling from the use cases a set of requirements and then mapping those requirements to um, some development <clears throat> Um, but the development in the individual projects has been, you know, sort of um, parochial, and um, and I think that again, this 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 highlights the fact that, you know, I mean, we could continue down that path, and maybe that's the right path. I don't know, but I do think that there's opportunity here for us to be, um, uh, you know, larger than the sum of its, you know, uh, something that's larger than the sum of its parts, mm -hmm. and. Yet right now, you know, I think if we continue down the path, then we're just the, the sum of our parts. Mm -hmm. I can, um, I also belong to the um, Google um, developer groups have been a, belong to that organization for uh, five plus years. And I noticed that um, they have a, an active, um, code labs in, in that help um, foster a community of app developers. And it's almost like you'd see some sort of opportunity to uh, stand things on their head and figure out what are the, what do the APIs look like across some popular projects? And, or maybe even there's some, I quite, I couldn't, I don't quite know what uh, Hyperledger Explorer does apart from the great demo we saw earlier, but if there's some sort of a, a RESTful API which is, has commonality, somehow understanding what that API looks like and the, cap the, the capabilities that it provides, and then, and then building, discussing and building the mobile app that would, mobile app client that would work with that and trying, to, and trying to use standards to do that, whether that's mobile web standards or or a, um, or a client that will work on both iOS and Android. So, um, you know, so Dan made a proposal. Um, I don't know if, do, 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 do we feel like that's fully fleshed that um, people are ready to, to think about making a decision on that proposal or is there a desire to maybe have a little bit more discussion? And... I'm fine with this, especially since Clive seems to agree to it, to, to agree with it too. Trying to, to get a sense of the group here. So I can't see your all, I can't see your faces. I, I do think that this that this, um, Dan mentioned another part of that, which is this discussion. That is kind of quite important for people that are new, you know, professionals arriving in there. They want to jump right into the, to Hyperledger and it bi-weekly provides that point, but it doesn't actually add too much other than just me giving some navigation updates. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to much more uh, turn that into, into some, into some help, turn that into some uh, some app, uh, so that the smaller projects uh, that don't come from, that in, don't come from folks don't come from large consultancies could get going with Hyperledger. Maybe think about coming back with a, a proposal that creates a discussion forum that might we meet uh, on the phone or, or video chat or something on some periodic basis. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. And 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 on the other on the other side of that, um, the 
coming up with a a mobile app is that also of interest um I know that there are some efforts to do mobile apps for the Indeed Ledger simply because it's the, the identity edge agents mandate it, but I don't know if there's a if there's general developer support for that at, at a broad hyperledger level or not. Yeah, it's been my experience with distributed apps that each each distributed app is you know an app unto itself, and so you would want a mobile component of of an app but I don't know if there's a good way to have a general purpose mobile client. But you know, I think we're always open to new projects and that's, that's something that maybe you could think on. And if there's a way to make that general purpose, uh, you could propose that as a project or, or maybe if, if you're able to have uh, what Hart was referring to here as an onboarding form, an onboarding call that, that might produce some, some other, uh, engineers that, that have a similar interest or, or designers for that matter that have similar interests and you might be able to collaborate on something. Yeah. Okay. I see the, <clears throat> there is a template uh, um, which is going to be for standardizing and launching working groups that is coming up. Uh, maybe some of this work on the edge uh, stuff is, uh, you know, could be generalized into a template I mean, generalized into a working group that can then work, at least explore some of these things without um, being bound to a specific projects, because that seems to be the biggest uh, uh, point that we are discussing today, because what seems to happen is there is a uh, fragmentation or balkanization, uh, and only the working groups are the only glue sort of uh, trying to hold things together rather than, um, uh, you know, the projects are naturally, uh, as they mature, they are diverging from each other. And as they mature, they have these two needs. One is, you know, some kind of a wallet app. The other working group uh, that probably should be there is some kind of a uh, deployment uh, focused working group that has, uh, gives, uh, you know, puts together some of the common themes around deployment. Uh, so the product, work product of a working group should not be seen in the same light as uh, the work product of a uh, project because most of the, you know, it's, it's lightly bound together and it's cross project most of the time. Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult to elicit uh, uh, support from people because they're not, you know, in most of these cases, uh, people are either employed by uh, technical companies or uh, to work full time on these projects like uh, Fabric or uh, Sawtooth or uh, Indie. Uh, of course, there is a cadre of people who come along to help, uh, you know, with the coding. But even they are, you know, either uh, somehow um, able to uh, to uh, devote. 100% or, or, you know, 80% of their time to this, uh, to producing uh, artifacts like code. But for the working groups, it's a different story, you know, that's, that's been our experience. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, so we have to rethink our uh, approach to working group and what the artifacts they produce should be. And I am proposing that uh, if Clive is wanting to produce some, uh, to actually create some uh, mobile app, you know, maybe it can be the launching pad uh, for, you know, a particular mobile app targeted to a particular uh, DLT, but at the same time be thinking about how that could, you know, those kind of things could be generalized into something bigger than uh, just one DLT. And so it's- Okay, it is so uh, sorry to cut you off. We're, we're kind of digressing away from the, the working group uh, agenda item. Yeah. We are. Well, okay. we haven't we haven't closed on it, and we only have a couple minutes left. So, I I think, you know, given that I didn't hear any pushback on, um, uh, you know, sort of calling a vote, I think so. The proposal, as I understood it, is basically to deprecate the requirements working group, and um, uh, I, I'm not sure how we archive, if you will, um, 
um, the, uh, the 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 products of the working group. I'm gonna maybe. Um, I, let, me, uh, let me just speak up in wiki, favor of keeping the working group. Different section of the wiki, but um, uh, I, I think that you know the proposal is basically to um, to deprecate the uh, the requirements working group and thank Clive uh, and and the others for their all their efforts. So Todd, you want to run a roll? Yeah, I think Brian, are you trying to? Yeah, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Just one one last ditch kind of thing to, to for folks to think about as a reason for um, a requirements working group to stay, which is all the time people ask us, you know, how what are what are some use cases? What are some ways in which I would use um, these underlying tools to meet you know specific challenges in my industry? And it's been very useful to say we have a set of use cases on the wiki that are abstractly defined that are uh, uh, you know um, uh, you know about explorations from a, um, a, a place where you can detach it from specific vendors um, to say here's how you would use uh, hyperledger technologies um, to address uh, you know supply chain issues healthcare issues those sorts of things and so you know it may be that that we need to uh, re reboot the requirements working group to do that um, uh, but it's been useful to have somebody that's uh, have a working group. I feel like um, separate from from the individual projects uh, as a, at least a place to direct that interest. Um, and uh, maybe it just needs a reboot. I don't know. But it feels like if we lost that working group, um, we might lose that cross project view um, of you know what are the kinds of ways you might use these technologies to solve those problems. I think Brian, just uh, picking up on that, um, I think maybe it might be good to. Uh, take a couple of weeks and just look at that and just in actually Jeremy um, had done a, some work very early on uh, when there was only a maybe a fabric uh, in terms of doing that almost like reverse engineering what are the capabilities of the interfaces of a uh, of a project and surface those so that they can um, so that people coming with requirements can understand what those are. I think the TSC is ready in a rare moment of decisiveness and alacrity to act. And I'd ask that we just continue on that stream. So I remove that we take a vote to close the working group. Doc? All right, so voting for for uh, closing the work group and archiving, correct? Yes. All right. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any abstaining? Any opposed? <laughs> all right, that passes unanimously. All right. Uh, thanks, everyone. We're at end of game, and um, I did send out the proposal for um, uh, the new milestone, and please weigh in also on um, the working group template discussion, and we'll pick those up next week. So thanks, everyone, and uh, have a nice day. Good morning.